Hi friends, Max Alash here. On this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, training think tank coach Brandon Dorman and I talk about what it takes to finish in the top 10% of the open so you can make it through to stage two. Before we get into it, make sure you hit that subscribe button because we're on our road to 35K subscribers. And when we hit that milestone, we're going to give away a Black Zinc Rogue 2.0 barbell. Let us know if you're excited to train for the CrossFit Open in the comments below. That comment is what's going to enter you into the giveaway. Once we reach that 35,000 subscriber milestone, we'll use a random YouTube comment generator on one of these videos where we promoted the giveaway to draw a worldwide winner for that bar. So all you got to do is be subscribed and comment below to enter. Train along some of the best athletes in the world at the sport of CrossFit. To get a free sample week of our current training cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. All right, so this, this podcast, really the goal of it was to discuss what does it take to be in the top 10%. What does it take to be in the top 10%? What does it take? What does it take? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Max Turn this <laughs> damn podcast off. Max said, bring the fire today. He's like, I, I'm tired. I need my coffee. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hey, look, you brought it. Was that the fire? Yeah. <laughs> that that the was the fire. first part. I'm waiting for Chris's next one. Oh my well, God. I was going for a Nelly reference and you just kind of passed out. <laughs> what does it take to be number one? Yeah. 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 That you didn't sound like Nelly. That's the problem. <laughs> what yeah. did you sound? What were you well, saying? Hold on. Here? What's your favorite Nelly song? Of all time? I don't have one. You know that old Nelly and Tim McGraw song? No. I mean, yeah, I, I, I know of it. <laughs> what, that was a thing for a while where like the country artists and the rappers got together. What was it? What was the song? Oh, man. I, um, I don't know. What the hell song were you singing? I was just <laughs> going you, you were just freestyling. I think we should abort this <laughs> yeah, part start, of the combo quick. What are we talking about? All right. So we're going to try to discuss what it takes to be top 10% because that's the threshold of what the cutoff is to make it from stage one to stage two of the open. We saw some videos of people giving like concrete numbers on clean and jerk 60 minute row. I don't really think those hold up. I don't think the actual numbers that were referenced hold up, but more so the nature of the sport is changing that it's really hard to pull data to tell people exactly what it takes. But we want to just discuss some of the numbers and the way that we're thinking about what a top 10% athlete looks like. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is, is it will continue to change. So each year we'll update this and kind of talk about, Hey, this is probably where you need to be to be top 10%. If they keep that threshold. I think the first thing though, is this new format allows more people to compete past the first stage of the open, yeah. which is a really cool thing because before, like even think with regionals or, you know, the other, the sanctional format that they had only so many people would go on. And I remember when they cut it down from, I think it was 48 at one point for regionals. It was, and then it was 60, 60, when I yeah, 60, 60 to 48, 48 to 20. Yeah, yeah. So they were like almost making it more and more exclusive, but then now they've opened it up to where, Hey, top 10% is probably going to be, you know, it depends on how many people sign up, which we'll talk about, but yeah. you're, you're talking about thousands and thousands of people that will be able to move on from stage one to stage two, and then have another opportunity to kind of ramp back up and compete. So I think that's the first thing. And another opportunity to pay a new registration fee. Exactly. <laughs> I saw there's a registration fee for the games, right? There's, I'm <laughs> sure it's, it's going to be crazy. It, so I think the first place that we probably should start is to say, there's a chance, right? Like, so you're telling me there's a chance kind <laughs> yeah, of thing yeah. where I think before it was just almost unrealistic. So people would sign up, they'd see the workout and be like, ah, I don't really want to do it. I think if you have ever been anywhere to, as far as competitive goes, top, top 10,000, top 15,000, then you have an opportunity based on what the workouts are to be able to get into that top 10%. So do all the workouts, do all three weeks, and then just see where everything stacks up. If you have to repeat, repeat the workouts to make sure that you get your best score. But I think it opens it up to, to much more, uh, at least the, the, the athletes that aren't as good as maybe they think they are and, or just aren't as well-rounded as they want to be. Yeah. I think it also brings in the ability for people to be recreational athletes, but still have exactly. some sort of an opportunity one time in a year. So the open used to be five weeks now, three weeks plus a one week break plus the end of that fifth week as your stage two is still five weeks. So with the same five week commitment that was previously in the open, you now have an opportunity to kind of test yourself in a more broad sense in CrossFit. You get whatever tests they, they bring out in stage one, two, and or in workouts one, two, and three of stage one, which are probably going to be lower skill, uh, lower loading. And then you're going to go into stage two with more of the demands of an in-person competition, because it's not the, like you can do a workout, re-strategize, repeat that workout. If you're getting four to eight workouts over four days, you actually have to treat it like an in-person competition. Right. So it's a little bit more, I don't know, I'd say engaging or exciting for people that are kind of into this as a recreational sport as well. 
Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I think that people are going to have to start thinking about that ahead of time too. That's like one of the things that we're doing in the design is like, Hey, if you know, you're going to make it through, then you need to start thinking about doing, uh, you know, maybe a hard training session, resting and doing another hard training session, because that may be the format for stage two. And that's something that most people haven't done before in the open. It's just, you do it once and then maybe you rest a couple of days and then you repeat on like, let's say a Monday. Yeah. Now it's for stage two, at least you're going to be doing one probably on a Friday and then have to do another one on a Saturday. So it's a different format, but I do think it makes it exciting. One of the things we were talking about before, and this really has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I think it, you know, a big picture for CrossFit, I think it's a good thing is that as Castro or whoever's programming continues to like put these almost like things that you don't think anybody can complete, but then the next year they get better and better. And you yeah. see all these people progress opening it up to more people will allow faster progress for more people in the sport because yeah. now more people are going to be bought into trying to make top 10% where you're going to see people like I don't have muscle ups and that's the last piece of the puzzle. They're going to be more focused on getting muscle ups or handstand push ups or handstand walking, whatever the skill may be. So I really do think it's an awesome thing for the sport. And I also don't think it's as far out of reach. I know I already said that, but I just kind of want to reiterate that. I think some, some of the numbers that I've seen people throw out, it's just so unrealistic, you know, like yeah. a 315 pound clean being top 10%. That's, that's top 0.1% if you're finishing yeah. that in a workout. So to give a perfect example in, in 20.4 to be top 10% in that workout, just worldwide, not in a, a certain yeah, yeah. continent, but worldwide, you only need to finish the 225 or 145 pound bar. Yeah. Now I know plenty of people didn't finish that, yeah. but that doesn't, that means you didn't have to hit the 275 bar or the 315 bar. And that's much more realistic to be top 10% in that workout than let's say hit, hitting a 315 clean. Yeah. I think the, the one RM totals are also not going to be that much of a relevant data point if the tests are going to be more basic in stage one as well. We used to right. have this concept of open athlete and regional athlete or open athlete and sanctional athlete. Now it's almost like there's stage one skills and needs and demands. Yeah. There's stage two needs and demands, which are a little bit like, you know, they're probably going to see things like in the age group qualifier in the past, they've had rope climbs. So you could potentially see something like rope climbs there or in stage one of the games this year, they had GHD sit up. So you could see that potentially there. Whereas in the open previously, that would not come out as a test. Right. So you're going to have this like group of testing movements that come out in stage one and there'll be a pattern from year to year that it's like, okay, this is a stage one priorities then stage two priorities. And then your in-person competitions bring out the more complex things like running and swimming and, you know, handstand walk obstacles. And so it, now it almost gives you another tier of athlete, which sure. was before it was just, there was just one cutoff point. You're either yeah. done in the open or you move on. Now it's like, okay, you can be doing stage one of the open and have a little bit more of a lower skilled movement subset of skills that you can do but pretty good fitness to get you to the next stage. And then, okay, now the movements get a little bit more complex and it's almost like escalating from step to step, which I like. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about some of these numbers Yeah, Go over some of them? Yeah. yeah obviously, you know, Max already said this. So I, I think that the first thing is, is this going to change? And it yeah. depends on the tests that come out. It also depends on how well-rounded an athlete is. So we can pull all these numbers and say, this is top 10% for that workout, but that's much different being top 10% for each workout. Cause if you did top 10% for all, let's say five open workouts in 20 point tw or 2020, yeah. then you would probably be top 2% in the world because you were so well-rounded. Yeah. Whereas being top 10% in the world, you could have a 30,000th place in one workout and then you could be top 500 and another one, like I have these crazy yeah. drastic, you know, measurements. Go ahead. No, no, you didn't finish your thought. I didn't want to cut you uh, off. No, I was just going to say, so then there's, you know, you didn't have to be as well-rounded maybe to get a really high score, but that could lower you on the leaderboard based on having one workout. Like I can't do muscle ups or I can't do strict handstand pushups that really lowers you. You yeah. know what I was thinking? Brandon probably sounds freaking crazy at two times speed. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Brandon is all uh, always at two times speed. Like it's Metcons as well. I gotta go check that out. <laughs> well, hey there, Chris, how are you doing today? <laughs> I, what I was going to say when I was, when I caught myself from cutting you off is that I would be a good example of somebody who doesn't have a balanced score distribution. My first two open workouts of last year, the, light power snatch and burpee for 10 rounds. And then 20.2 was the 20 minute bar, AMRAP, double yeah. under dumbbell thrusters. Dumbbell thruster total Those rate. scores were awful. But then right. when the, when the loading and the complexity of skills went up, I was much better. And I was in like, I think I was in the top thousand or top 2000 in the last three workouts, right. which overall aggregated my score that I probably would be a top 10%. However, in this structure, 
I probably wouldn't be a top 10% athlete because the tests are going to be lighter, yeah. lower skilled, more body weight dependent. So just having the data from 2020 to say, Hey, this is what a 10% or, or even let's say we aggregated 2018, 2019, 2020. Now we know, okay, well the movement selection is going to be different. And because the movement selection is different, it's going to select for a different style of athlete. Exactly. You could potentially have a lighter, more class style athlete. Like the elites, I mean, the argument like, oh, well, the elites do get through because it's a good test of fitness. It's like, well, they're good at everything. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you put in the test. But from a balanced distribution perspective, being top 10% in this format could be a very different overall looking athlete than what top 10% was in the in the past, especially yeah. because they want to try to encourage in a COVID year where people aren't at the gym and, you know, they gave this small equipment list, they're trying to encourage people to do it. If that's all the equipment that you have and you're trying to like doing a max deadlift, for example, the likelihood that people would have that much weight at their house, if they were in a place that was locked down and they were giving equipment out is so low. So like you have logistical constraints that go into workout creation every year. So I think even things like that are going to skew the data. So I think it, we can go back into these numbers and look at specific workouts from 20.1, but I think it's more about critically thinking and being honest with yourself that this data might not be like super clear to base your expectations yeah. off of. Well, you, Do you, you have any good examples of times where the data doesn't tell the story well? Well, I think just in general, if we will, you talked about aggregating all the data from 2018, 2019, 2020, we, if we look back at 2018, all the best and even like your RX level athletes are way better now than they were in 2018. So like a perfect example is Mike obviously is a higher level athlete, but Mike retested 18.1 this weekend and he beat his last score by like 40 something reps. Yeah. And a so, round and a half. Yeah. So like if he's doing that, that means he's bumping up the leaderboard, but that doesn't mean that it's just him, right? Like yeah. everyone else is continuing to get better. And you see that even at the best, the top in the sport, yeah. you know, Frazier or Noah, obviously frazier has gone, but like each time there's a retest, he would just get a little bit faster, a little bit better. Yeah. And that's kind of the nature of the sport. I think it's an amazing thing, but that also means that if we compared it and said, well, your number has to be 200 reps in this, yeah. this workout from 2018, the likelihood is it's probably 210 reps now or 215 reps. So yeah. that's one way you look at it. I think that the way that you pull the data though, Chris, would be like, I'm just looking at this to kind of hedge my bets of making sure that I'm working on the things I need to work on. So like a perfect example of this is three or four years ago, to be top 10%, you didn't have to have a muscle up in the female field. Now you must have a muscle up to be in top 10% based on the, the workouts that we've seen recently. So if you don't have a muscle up and you're a female athlete trying to get top 10%, the likelihood is at least in that workout, yeah. you're going to have to be able to do one or you're going to have to crush the other workouts. But there's no rings in stage one. Just in general, just though, as, like, an as an example. Yeah. yeah. But that's why it's so hard to scrub data and try to get some sort of a clear actionable, either actionable as to like, well, how do I prioritize my training right now? Or a even just clear expectation of, am I a 10% athlete? Yeah. So I think we can, right. I was going to say, it sounds like we've gave a pretty nice caveat for everybody. Let's what, get into uh, it. what were some of the numbers that were wrong and what are some of the ones that y'all have? Well, so some of the videos that we saw were referencing tests, yeah. 60 minute row, which that as a metric is just, it's not really a good data point. It's never been tested in the open. We've never really gone long in the open comparing a row that's super long to something like 19.1 or even 18.1 that has short segments of bursted rowing is not going to really, it, they're not going to go hand in hand with one another. There may You've, be some correlation, but, but there's very no causation. Yeah. yeah. And the, the better way to put it would just kind of, if you're thinking about CrossFit and knowing like what we now do, like Evan's done a great job in the classroom of talking about like the different lim limitations someone may yeah. have. Someone could just be good on the rower, just be good on the ski erg or a triathlete's really good at running and maybe swimming. But they're, if they come into a gym and have to do thrust thrusters, that's a totally different demand. So yeah. that's something to think about, but yeah. Yeah. Ahead. So I, I think 20.1 and 20.2 would probably be really good barometers in terms of data points for yourself to look at that are tests that are probably going to align with what you would see in stage one. Yes. But 20.2, well, 20.2 was double unders thrust, dumbbell thrusters and, and toes to bar. To bar. So yeah. like 
those movements, they said one dumbbell was required. So, but those movements will be close enough to, I think right. what you see. So I th- think that's probably the first place we should start is let's yeah. look at what it would, what does it take on those to be top 10% male, female? Yeah. I think obviously there's, a, there's going to be a broad range and you have to keep in mind you, I think that every athlete has to be, Hey Noah, oh, 20.2. be more self-reflective of where they're good and where they're bad. The tendency is, is that they say, I'm not top 10% in this workout, so there's no hope for me. Yeah. But just like you said, you may do poorly on one workout, but there, if there are three weeks and maybe even more than three workouts, there's an opportunity for you to go up the leaderboard. So that's just kind of like another thing to think about. Top 10% worldwide, just per workout. Let's talk about that because I think that's an easier way to kind of see the number and say, where was I at? Yeah. For males, you need to be right around that 14 minute mark or faster. So that was the 10 rounds for time of eight power snatches at 95, 65, and then 10 bar facing burpees. just under that. Yeah. You were 1330 or something like yeah, that, I thought. I right? thought 1330 or 1350. Yeah. So if you were under 14 minutes, you essentially top 10% in the world on that workout. For the best in the world, to kind of give you an idea of where that gap is though, they were under nine minutes. Yeah. So there's still this huge gap, but I guess that's what I mean. When you make talk about top 10%, there's enough, there's a huge gap there for the people that maybe are good at one thing, but not good at these other things or really strong, but don't have a ton of capacity to squeeze in if the tests are right. So yeah. that's one way to look at it for the females. Now this is a little bit different because of burpee speed. They were right under 15 minutes to be top 10%. So there's a minute difference, but even in the top of the sport, other than like the very best females, most of the guys were faster than that one, just because of the burpee speed. Do you think this is another kind of caveat or thought process I've been going through is if we have a sign up that is way less in terms of total people and theoretically the people that are going to be signing up in this year are probably the more better. serious, yeah. better people. Is it going to be harder or are those, is that like 10% yeah. thing going to line up? I think that you're, that was one of the things I want to talk about after going over the numbers is I think you're going to see less people sign up, which means like you said, the better, more focus or the people that just have more time because like this is their more serious hobby or like this is their obsession. They're going to be the ones that sign up and they're probably going to be a little bit better. So that's going to skew the numbers to maybe instead of let's say 1350 for a top 10% for a male, now it's going to be 1250 to 1320, something like that. But there's still room there for most people. There were a ton of people on the leaderboard that were anywhere from that 13 to 15 minute range. And if you have continued to get better since then, then the likelihood is, is you can at least be competitive in a workout like that if it comes out. Yeah. So like that, that, that's a, that's a clear example data point of like max clean and jerk is probably not going to give you anything relevant most likely. And you're not going to be able to find anything on an open leaderboard that tells you that because in 20, in, in 2020, the heavy thing was embedded into 20.4, 2019, 2019.2, 2018 was the heavy clean, clean. but we talked about how much like performance has escalated over that period of time. So something like 20, 20.1 is just a good test to use as like a barometer for just general fitness. Now it might not be if somebody's not good at burpees, for example, let's just say that's the one movement that they're yeah. like, Hey, I'm really shitty at this. And it's probably going to come out in stage one. I mean, it comes out in yeah. <laughs> every CrossFit thing, but then you have the opportunity on the other two tests to kind of offset those scores. Right. Yeah. I think if you're bad at burpees, this is kind of the whole point of the video for me is like, you need to be looking at that ahead of time. And that's one of the things that we try to do with our individual clients is what are your, your performance limitations? Where are the numbers at? And what do you need to get better at to be top 10% or maybe for some of of our athletes to get to the semifinals or make it to the games? What are the numbers that are holding you back? What are the movements that are holding you back? Let's make sure we're working on those. Yeah. And I think even in, in design, in the intermediate path, when we moved into the second phase of open prep, Mia took the list of movements and list of equipment that was required for stage one and changed all of the training to be focused on that. Right. Whereas in the leap path, I would never do that. Cause like yeah. if, if Noah or Travis doesn't finish in the top 10%, like something <laughs> they happened, they, they lost, should fire yeah, you. Yeah, they, I mean, they <laughs> lost a leg before yeah. they showed up. There's, there shouldn't be anything that holds them back. So putting all their training focus and preparation on that, stage doesn't make sense. So I think having a a more clear understanding, I mean, obviously we don't have super clear, but just general guidelines of like, Oh, I'm probably on the bubble at 10% in this 
format, or I'm definitely going to make it through 10%, but that next stage is going to be hard to get through. That can make you have a more informed training structure to prepare yourself. Yeah. So 20.2, again, I agree with you. I think this is a really good test that you, something similar will come out. So they said pull up bar, jump rope, and one dumbbell, right? right? Right. So So maybe obviously not double dumbbell thrusters, but you could see a single arm or maybe it's something with like some kind of uh, dumbbell snatch with thruster or uh, with dumbbell or toes to bar and double unders. So thank you very much for laughing at me. (laughs) For the males in this one, top 10% worldwide was just under 19 rounds. So that's basically less than one round per minute, which is kind of the score. I think most people were trying to, they obviously after watching people go 30 rounds, were like, that's unrealistic, but can I go around a minute? So if you're anywhere close to that, I think you could be competitive, be top 10%. For females, it was right at 16 rounds. So there was also a drop off. Now this is another thing that's important to point out it's going to change. I really do think that the female field is going to continue to have more and more depth, but right now the male field just has way more depth, at least for the top 15 or 20%. Yeah. There's a big drop off. The, the best females are really, really, really good. And then there's a big drop off just with the gymnastic skills, yeah. with double unders, some things like with the toes to bar in that workout yeah. that caused some issues. You saw it in 20.5 with the muscle ups. There were a ton of people that just got stuck with, because a lot of the females couldn't do the muscle ups or only a few, but then you had some females that were just as fast as the males in that workout. So yeah. there's just a bigger gap there between the best and kind of the rest of the field. Yeah. I think t- 20.5 was the like, make your own adventure right. workout. That's like another workout that data is not going to really tell you the story that great because you could break it up however you want, get through all the wall balls and rowing and just do, you know, one muscle up right. and separate yourself in the female field. In the male field, it's not as common because I feel like just upper body requisite strength is just, it's just better in males generally. And those skills are harder to obtain for females. So it just seems like there's less of those competitive females out there that once you acquire those skills, you almost automatically put yourself in that top 10%. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think especially the the gymnastic skills, the muscle ups and the handstand push ups are two big ones. If we look at historically all the numbers for the female fields, those are the two things that if you're good at, even if you don't have a huge engine, yeah. you can still be competitive. And you've seen that, like even in 20.5, there are plenty of people that weren't great at some of the other workouts, like 20.2 or 20.1, but they were really good at muscle ups and they actually did well in that workout. So like, as you scour the leaderboard, you can kind of see the difference in the female field. Whereas in the male field, usually those that did well in 20.1 or 20.2 also did well in 20.5. Just kind of everyone's a little bit more even with things like muscle ups or handstand push ups. Yeah. So I want to circle back. We talked about clean and jerk and the most relevant workouts, 20.4 that ties to it. If we go at that same model and say, okay, well, it, you have to clear the third barbell to basically yeah. be a top 10% athlete. And that means that you had the 275 and the 315 bar remaining. Yeah. Would we extrapolate that the same way for something like 17.3? It means that you probably need a 185 pound or 135 pound snatch yeah. uh, for something like 19.2. It means that your clean probably is the same as the clean and jerk. 25. So it seems like once you can go through that and maybe in, it has to be above that because you have to be able to cycle that weight in a quasi fatigue setting. But those are really like from right now with a very limited perspective of time and very small data set. If I had to put my money on it and say, Hey, if you could do these skills, you're pretty close to being a top 10% athlete. That's probably what I would say. I mean, cause they yeah. have to build the tests around the audience that's doing the test. And if you build the test to suit Noah, Frazier, Sarah, whoever it is at the top, then there's going to be this many people that can even do the workout. Right. And they're trying to get, I mean, one of his open goals, Roses, is to have 500,000 people in the open. If that's the case, the tests have to be accessible in stage one. So if you're going through and you're going to scour data, I think the you know 20.1, 20.2, and going back and even just looking at 19.1 and 19.2 and looking at the earlier tests in the open is going to give you a better... Uh, a better vantage point on what you're looking at with regards to who's going to be a top 10 percenter by the end of the, this uh, I hope season's. they fuck you up with that one. Oh, they and they put like, <laughs> they put one RMs and stuff in yeah. it. Yeah. That'd be very, I mean, I could see them do that, but yeah. even if you looked at the, the tests that have had one RM, so 2015, there was the clean and jerk. That was yep. 15.1 and 15.1 a, and then 2018, they had the 
10 down to one and then yeah. the max clean, the, the top 10% for those was still well under the 315 pound yeah. markers, 278, I believe in 2015, obviously clean and jerks a little bit yeah, more yeah. challenging because you have to go overhead and a lot of people can clean, but can't jerk. And then it was, you know, 286 or something. I don't have the actual numbers in front of me, but I've pulled that before. So yes, that's, you have to be strong, but yeah. you don't have to be 315 or 275 pounds snatch, which is a number, another number that I heard. I think those are just even now, those are top 1.1% numbers in a fatigued setting yeah. for, I mean, you're talking about only 150 or 200 I mean, guys in the world are doing that. Yeah. And Kyle Bernier on site, he took third in the trials competition, yeah. which is like now one of the bigger online competitions that ran in 2020. I know it's a weird year cause it's COVID, but he's been to regionals twice or three times. He's qualified for Dubai. He's pretty much qualified for every biggest competition that could be out there except the games. And he doesn't have those. Um, no, right. I mean, he cleans 355, but a clean end jerk at 315, he wouldn't be able to well, hit. He didn't hit the 315 last year. Exactly. But he's like you said, I mean, he's just as fit as anybody in the world. Yeah. So you're, you're the, the data has to be appropriate to who you're going after. And if you say, Hey, you need this to be top 10% and you might need that to be top point. 1%. Yeah. You might need that to be a podium level games athlete. And you probably could be, you know, a very, very elite games competitor without those high threshold one RMs, as long as you can do all the other skills really well. Yeah. You also got to think about it's going to change based on the continent too. So this was kind of the last point that I had. It may look different in North America to be top 10% and how good those numbers are versus maybe let's say Europe or Asia or Australia or USA so, <laughs> and Canada and Mexico. <laughs> 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 Not to say that one's going to be better than the other, but th those numbers are going to look different. How many people sign up? Yeah. And then the depth of the field is obviously different. It's definitely changed over the last couple of years. But you think about even like back in the regional days, you know, over in Asia, it wasn't near as strong. Now, as the CrossFit community grows over there, it's become stronger and stronger, but yeah. it's still not as competitive as, let's say, North America or Europe. Those two are very competitive at the top of the, the leaderboard. Yeah. 20.3 was deadlift, deadlift handstand, handstand push up, yeah. handstand walk. So. Yeah, so Most likely not a stage one workout. They didn't say anything about having a long space to handstand walk right. on or lunge on. So, well, so here's the good news not. for that. If that was to come out, you don't even have to get to the handstand walk to be top 10% for You male just have or to female. finish Diane. You have to do the Diane and then you have to be able to get anywhere from five to 10 deadlifts for yeah. females. And then you have to be pretty close to finishing the 21 deadlifts for males. But like yeah. that still means that or maybe you're kicking up and doing five feet. It depends on yeah. how many people sign up, but that the numbers that we have from the last two times they've tested it, most of the top 10% or to be top 10%, you were doing the yeah. deadlifts and not yeah. doing any handstand walking. To be top 10% in the world at something, it sounds like a really difficult task. It's like you got to dedicate your day-to-day -day existence to being really good at this. Yeah. In CrossFit as a sport right now, it's not really the case. I mean, to be a top 10% in the world golfer or swimmer or triathlete, you're talking about being able to dedicate enormous amounts of time. Now, the best of the best in CrossFit relative to the 10 percentile are like, or the 90th percentile are, are off the charts. It's not even close, but a top 10% is, it's a reasonable target. It's something like I could do with 90 minutes of training four times a week. If I dedicated it solely to CrossFit and competed in it as a 34 year old, Right. Like those, yeah. if, so if you know that those things are attainable, I feel like it sets you up for being like, oh, this isn't something that's such an unreasonable thing that I need to be a professional CrossFitter and thinking about all the data. I think really that's the, the key point in all of this is that top 10% is something that if you're even like a class member who loves CrossFit, that really lo like, Ooh, likes getting after you're making it. this heart hurt even worse because now after i hear this if i don't make toppers <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm so, I'm so yeah. worth it. <laughs> yeah. yeah i didn't mean it like that i mean it still could be tough it's, to, it's going to be hard yeah but no, i, I know what you mean I'm, yeah yeah i think it's unfair <laughs> for people to make it unrealistic for when you i mean look there were 120,000 over 120,000 men that signed up in 2020 yeah just worldwide that means 12,000 of those men 
get to move on to stage two. Yeah. So look at those numbers. Just look at those numbers. Am I there? And the, or if you've competed before, then you know, was yeah. I 15,000th? Was I 1500th? Whatever yeah. it may be. Then you know exactly how much better you need to be. Obviously the field changes, the numbers are going to change, the test kind of dictate who is in that top 10%, yeah. but it's much more attainable than I think some people have made it out to be. But I can assure you that of the CrossFit field, the numbers that we've heard are not necessarily true to make it into the top 10%. Yeah. Any other tests in 2020 that are even relevant? Because that 20.4 was the clean and jerk yeah, I, workout, I, which I we already think, talked about. You got to get through the, the is that, that's actually the fourth barbell, right? Because it went 95, 135, yeah, 185, yeah. 225. And is that the same for females? The, the fourth same, barbell? yeah, is 145 pounds for the females. So you which finishing is where they that. Get, yeah. yeah. And I do think that it may be necessary now to have good pistols, good enough pistols. Yeah. So it's, it's more about the, the body weight skills that you may see. So having yeah. good double unders is going to matter a little bit more. I mean, even getting 19 rounds for males in 20.2, that's you're moving pretty fast. So it's yeah. those that are pretty efficient at double unders and efficient at toes to bar, yeah. toe to bar. Uh, I think having good pistols, like I just said, and then also also thinking about burpees and air squats. Those yeah. two things may come out and that may mess some people up that historically are top 10% because let's say they're strong. Like for you, if you're doing a ton of air squats versus someone that that's my size, I'm probably going to go a little bit faster, but you're going to crush me in a barbell. So then it's like, how do we balance those things out? When you're thinking about your training, yeah. that's also the way that you probably should be setting up your, your kind of testing phase right now as you lead into the open. One thing I was just thinking about, so they're trying to like, it make, a, a whole new system, a whole new way of testing. Even the game stage one last year was a little bit different. I mean, a one K yeah. row freestanding handstand hold, those were part of the tests in stage one of the games. If that comes down into stage one, does that mean we'll see things like they put jump rope in it? I saw a video Castro put out of him doing speed steps next to Travis. Like, could they be like next to our Travis? Yeah. He's yeah. like clipped in a video of him and Travis. He clipped a video of Travis doing speed steps and him doing speed steps, looking at the form discrepancies. But is that a what hint? was his point? Yeah. I don't well, know. Did he, he beat him? No, no. He said oh, okay. something about look how high my knees come relative oh, gotcha. to his or something like yeah. that. I didn't, I didn't read too much into it. I just thought about that right now though. Could it be like, yeah, more like, Hey, we're doing skills. speed steps or we're doing right. single unders as part of the test. Like that's something that people need to be prepared mentally to deal with, especially the best in the sport. Cause yeah. the best in the sport are used to like, Oh, double unders, weighted double unders. These are the testing bodies. They could come out yeah. and be like, Hey, it's testing every, everything and anything. And in the beginning stages, we want regular people to feel comfortable doing it. We're testing single unders in this. And if you haven't done speed steps before, let me tell yes. you, they are Especially actually very Especially if you hard. have to go fast. Yeah. I mean, it, the coordination demand is probably just as hard as yeah. it, the, the counting nightmare would be horrendous. Oh, that would but be tough. It's just something to consider that past data could be an even worse predictor of what the sport looks like moving forward because they could change the sport. Yeah. New leadership could change what is tested. And one of the other things too, that we've noticed just trends on crossfit.com. We follow those workouts. We want to see, are they changing it? Are they biasing it? We've seen many more interval style workouts over the last couple of years. That has nothing to do with this, but just yeah. in general, like we noticed that they're adding those kind of things in maybe from seeing other companies that yeah. do stuff like that, or more just like s single modality into a heavy lift, or you'll see something like half your body weight, 20 burpees, and then half your body weight back squats for yeah. five rounds, like random stuff like that. The big one is lowering the load. So we've noticed that there's been 65 pound bars for men and 45 pound bars for women. That may be another option that you see just to kind of keep the weight, yeah. uh, you know, not saying, Hey, you have to have 400 pounds to do a max clean or something like that for the strongest guy in the world. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the logistic components of that should all play a role in how you're thinking about it. Um, data wise, should we go back to 2019? I mean, row wall ball was the first test. There's not a wall ball on stage one. So I feel like that's kind of irrelevant. doesn't really tell you anything. 19.2 was the, the clean, squat clean yeah. double under. So that was a, that was a year where the more complicated, heavier tests came out earlier. 19.3 was the strict handstand push up box step up. Yeah. Um, handstand, handstand walk to finish. Yeah. 250, yeah. 50. Yeah. So that's not really a super relevant test that could tell us anything about a stage one athlete in the top 10%, 19.4. Can't remember that what was 19. The chipper. Point. Was that the 55 chipper? Did they No, they, that wasn't that year. No, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. I think that the big picture for most people is look back at your most recent scores and then also try to compare to the things that you have on the leaderboard right now. And if yeah. you haven't done an open workout, 
go back and at least look at 2020, get a feel for kind of where everyone else is at. And then within your training group, kind of get a feel for where you're at. That's yeah. not a, the best indicator if you're training with a bunch of people that are way better than you, because then the likelihood is you're probably not top 10%. But if you look at like our throwdown leaderboards, we have a bunch of really good people on there. You can kind of get a feel where, okay, all of these people are going to be top 10%. Where do I fall in here? Am I competitive? Am I falling off on certain workouts? And then that can kind of help you at least target the certain things that you need to work on that are limitations for you. So we got about three weeks coming up until the open, right? By the time this video comes out, it'll be three or four weeks. I can't remember yep. exactly how much. What advice would you have? So there's a group of people that are pretty sure they're going to be top 10%. And it doesn't mean it's guaranteed because anyone can get exposed. And if you haven't learned that in this sport yeah. yet, like it's it's almost a guarantee that something comes out that surprises us or- Is Ricky know, back is this new. year? I think it's next year. Oh, yeah, I. There That's when was, Fraser's going to come out of retirement. Yeah, there was a like a, somebody posted something like a, a meme about how disappointed Ricky was when he heard that Fraser retired. <laughs> <laughs> it was my favorite thing. That I was I looking forward to seeing the battle. Yeah, I really wanted to see it. Too. Yeah, that dude's got a lot of fire. Yeah, um, you'll be happy to know that I uh, found a cat a couple weeks ago and I've kept him. And did I've you, named him Ricky. You did name him Ricky, yeah. but what would you name You're when you thought it was a girl? Well, I thought, yeah, I thought it was a girl. So I was calling it Kiki. <laughs> well, I was calling it Kitty. Then I was calling it Kitty Kitty. And then if you say that in like a little baby voice, it's, come here, Kiki. <laughs> and so I was like, it's Kiki. And then when I found out those were balls, I was like, well, Ricky. <laughs> Can you put a photo? I need to is, see. Uh, Ricky? <laughs> yeah, I'll, is, get, I'll get one queued up. Is Ricky friendly with Ruff? Yeah, him and Ruff get along. They're bros now. Yeah. Nice. Wow. I was, I'm cool. surprised. I was worried about yep, that. At yeah. First. So my it's back, a little rough and big Rick <laughs> <laughs> back to my question. Would you, what would you give as advice to people that are in that? Maybe I'm top 10%. Like let's call that the bubble line somewhere between yeah. the ninth and 11th percent. I think if you're serious about it, then you need to have a repeat plan in place. So like you talked about the best in the sport or like in our design program, all the people in the elite path, they're just going to test it once because we know they're going to be top 10%. So they'll do the workout on Friday. They'll do their recovery work, strength work, and then it's just normal training. They're looking forward to stage two. For the rest of us that are unsure, let's say that I am that nine to 11%. I think having a plan in place, that's like, I'm going to do it on Friday. My whole goal for Saturday and Sunday are to recover so that I can retest on Monday because because the reality is, is that it's seconds in this sport. And we've seen that with the old regional format or sanctional format can be hundreds of spots. And that yeah. may be the difference between you being 11% and 10% top. How so, are you doing it in the design? Yeah. Is so our, the, that's the cool thing is our intermediate path becomes our repeat path. So we've sa already said this in some of the videos that we've put out over the weekends of like, Hey, if you're a, a RX path athlete right now, but you're, you want to repeat, you're going to go to our quote unquote, repeat path. They're going to set it up to where they're doing it on Friday. They're doing it on Monday, Saturday, and Sunday are really more like recovery. Yeah. Days. We think because there could be multiple tests sure. that come out and that could change a little bit, but basically the y'all, y'all are making it on the fly. So that doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Every Thursday, the workout will come out. So basically the elite path is training as much as yeah. we possibly can. We're training through the stage one. Yeah. The RX path is complicated because there are like, if I were following the design program, I'd be an RX athlete. I only have one, you know, one block of time a day to train for CrossFit. I can do all the skills. I don't aspire to be an elite athlete. I right. don't have time or the capacity to adapt to all of that stuff. So I want to focus on the end of gym stuff, but I'm really a bubble top 10% athlete in this new system. So I'd probably have to shift down into the repeat path through the open right. and then move back to the RX path after it was over. Be just honest be with me. If you were in the program paying customer, would you actually do that? Well, I would have to, because I'd have to repeat the tests. Yeah. Right. So if you're repeating the tests, you can't be doing the training on RX. Well, that's now, a, would my ego have let that's me what I'm post asking. there? Yeah. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. I, th I think I, I can swallow my yeah. pride enough. To the do the that. nice thing about that is like, you definitely would want to go down or I don't want to say go down. You would want to move to the intermediate path because then the way that me is structuring it is it's all set up. You don't have to worry about a thing. Yeah. You know that you're testing on Friday, you're retesting on Monday, and then all the training is basically revolving around the tests that come out that week. And you can't train through something that you need to be your absolute exactly. best for. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, I want to hit a hard training session on Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm like, why? You need to be fresh on Friday yeah. for your first attempt. So it really, it's really going to depend because, so I would be that person in an RX system, but there could be another RX athlete 
who is like, there's no way they're going to be held back because yeah. they're 180 pounds. They can do all the skills. They love body weight, AMRAPs, chippers, and all the stuff that is generally the lower load, higher rep type workouts. And they have zero concerns about being held back. So they stay in the RX. Right. So we try to come up with options. And I think that is really what um, is necessary for people is to figure out how does the training right now for the next three weeks, but then through the open and stage two, does it match your athletic level and what you're trying to yep. get out of the, you know, the competition And the same can be said for the master's division because they aren't doing stage two until five weeks after stage yeah. one. So we're going through a whole training cycle leading into stage two, whereas for RX or elite, like it's literally that, like you said earlier, a one week turnaround and you have to prep for that. So you have that in mind when you're riding the elite or Mike has that in mind yeah. when he's riding the RX. For me and the masters, I'm thinking about, we want to make sure they're prepped for stage one and we want to get as many people through as possible. If they they don't get it. If they don't make it through, then they're still going to have a training plan within the design, but then everyone else is going to be fitting into let's prep for stage two for these five weeks, yeah. but it has to play into what does our training look like over those three weeks in stage one. So if people got nothing else from this podcast, what's the big takeaway you want to make sure that they go home with? So just one <laughs> takeaway. I was about yeah, to go well, through a like a list. I'm like, well, one. No. Uh, okay, you can no, do no, a little no, list. No, no, no. Let, list. let Brandon start. I'll see if I can reduce it down to one if yeah. he says something really smart. No, well, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever have, to be honest with you. I really do think the first thing is have some hope, right? Like even if you know that it's unreal, hope. if it's unrealistic, at least do the workouts and just get a good data set for yourself so that you know what to train over this next year. If CrossFit is, you're serious about it and you want to yeah. make top 10% at some point in the future, there's always an opportunity and we don't know what the tests are going to look like. It could be all body weight stuff and you're someone that's a body weight ninja. You're not strong. So you're worried about it because you heard of these heavy cleans or heavy snatches and that doesn't come out. You could still make it. Now yeah. you probably won't do well in stage two. That's just reality. Yeah. But at least you made one of your goals. And yeah. then you can go back and look at it and say, here are the things I need to get better at. Yeah. And if there are, this is not my point, but if the, let's say there's two <laughs> workouts. <laughs> like, that's it. That's all you get. <laughs> I wanted to jump on Brandon's hope train. If there's two workouts every week in stage one and, and I'm wrong and they do come out with a max lift, there's a max deadlift or a yeah. max back squat or something that I did not anticipate coming out. There could potentially be six tests over the course of three weeks. If you have one crash of a test, you can make up for it for the other five. For sure. So I really do think it is good. If you're somebody who's kind of competitive and you're like, I want to do the open, but I only want to do it if I can finish top 10%. I do think it's way more realistic than what I've observed people talking about and referencing data points that to me don't really make sense relative to what we see in testing. Yeah. On that same line, just sorry, this yeah. might be like a stupid shut the fuck up thought, but like when you watch like a basketball game and they're getting blown out by like 20, there's almost something to be said, like to keep, you know, keep showing up and keep playing well, one. Cause you might actually get lucky and win the game, yeah. but also you're practicing all those in game scenarios. Yeah. And in the same way here, it's like, if you do tank and you know, you're not going to do as good as you thought, this is still good practice to learn. Yeah. You know, I, I so mean, don't phone it in when you know you're sucking because you still want to learn all you the, can. The yeah. thing I always say is like, this is your, for most people, this is your one opportunity to compete all year. And take Especially it serious. with COVID. Yeah. And take it serious. So like, give it your all. Just go out there and see what happens. That doesn't mean repeat the yeah. workout 16 times, but like have a strategy in place, retest the workouts as needed. Make sure you have a recovery plan, nutrition plan, all of that to take it, take it as seriously as you can. Yeah. I think sports can be a catalyst for self-actualization, self-awareness, yeah. whatever you would call it, because it gives you that opportunity to do something that you would never challenge yourself to do otherwise. I mean, most people aren't going out and trying to be professional athletes or Navy SEALs or, or do anything that pushes them far out of their physical comfort zone. You'd be super surprised how many just regular people that just like exercising will do that and yeah. find things inside of themselves from a workout. And that is a good opportunity to do it in the open because you generally have company. Yeah. You have other people in your gym, other people in your online communities that are doing the same thing and you can commiserate and laugh about <laughs> it and learn. And I think it's an, it's an important thing to, to practice that and put yourself in those scenarios to grow as a human. Even if the end goal of that is just to be like, eh, I don't really like doing that. It's too yeah. hard. Sometimes people find their passion for doing things like that because they realize how rewarding going out of your comfort zone can be when it's all said and done and you can look back and think about how much you've progressed and overcame to just do something that's like whatever 50th percentile on the leaderboard. Yeah. It's still like that is not real where the real learning is. That was beautiful. But what's your points? 
Oh, my points. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's <laughs> sitting there waiting for me. I know. Like, yeah, yeah. Hurry this yeah, up. Yeah. I would say that it, it's important to have clear intentions when you go into the open yeah. and then a training focus that is purposeful relative to that intention so that your preparation from now until the open and through the open matches what you're trying to get out of it. And if your goal is just to like sign up and fuck around and get after it for one attempt and whatever, then set your training up that way. If your goal is to like, Hey, I'm going to go in there and fight for the top 10%, then set your training up that way to mimic the demands of what you're about to face in the next month or so. That was wonderful. Mm, very simple. I love it. Yeah. I was going to go bullet pointed, but uh, can we end it there, or should we ask one more bonus question? I'd like a bonus toy. Bonus. bonus toy. Bonus toy. Bonus toy. Bonus, toy. bonus, bonus octopus. <laughs> <laughs> we might have some octopus shirts coming. I don't we know. do. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know um, this for a fact. Uh, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, maybe the most important qu question. Open's coming. I'm signed up. Should you I wear are? nanos or metcons? Mm. I've I have these. What are those? What are, what are those? What? <laughs> they're, Brooks? they're neutral Brooks running shoes, which have really helped me walk with a better gait. What does that mean? I'm going to say. I was like really rolling out because the other ones I had were like anti-pronation shoes and it was like bothering my ankle. So you were, yeah, it was like, where did you even like, find those? <laughs> these, uh, I typed Damn in yeah. running shoes clearance. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my they were God. the cheapest ones. <laughs> yeah, I'm the wrong person to ask. Let's see about those this. puppies. Yeah, these are my my. Zero oh my shoes. goodness! Yeah, these are amazing. I wish I, you had the other ones on the ones that are like literally just a piece of plastic it, or whatever it is. It's the same thing, really. Yeah, I you mean, ever stepped on anything crazy, like a nail or something? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like where it went through your shoe. You oh, <laughs> no, no, Maybe. No. No, I can't remember that yeah. one. I walk around barefoot all the time at home and I step on shit and have to pull it out of the bottom of my feet all the time. I hate uh, that. I feel like I have no sensation in the bottom of my foot. It's like I, a three inch pad of just like dead skin. Mine are so fat. sensitive. <laughs> so sensitive. I like to step on the asphalt outside that's basically smooth. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I just gotta put yeah, shoes on. I, I'm a hobbit. <laughs> I'm a we giant should, we should do the uh, Lego challenge in here one time. Step on Legos where, you know, well, they do it on a treadmill, but we could do it on like the air runner where you, someone's standing in the front and as you're running, I'll like drop Legos down oh. and you're barefoot. We uh. used to have races on gravel, barefoot races on gravel. And it was like my, it was the only time I ever won races. Nice. I don't yeah. know how you would do that. I'm just numb to, <laughs> to pain. I, all pain. Well, not all pain. Start, I'm numb to emotional pain as well. Breathing heavy. I'm like, oh my God, I'm dying. But you could cut my feet. So those races were like three seconds long. Though. They were probably less than 50 yards. Yeah. Those okay. are the only races I can win. <laughs> all right, boys. Head over to trainingthinktank.com to get you a competition manual. Dot com. <laughs> C O trainingthinktank.com. Oh, no, no, no. If you actually want that, you got to go to trainingthinktank.com. Slash competition manual. There you'll find the competition manual and and the competition yeah. manual. <laughs> Littering in. All right. You also could check out trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN where we talk about how we are preparing for each one of the paths before mm -hmm. the open and through the open. Maybe that gives people some. More specifically, you mean you touched on it here, but y'all have videos up that say exactly. How what the week's going to look like. How each division, elite, RX, intermediate, which is also yeah. repeat, and masters will train for the next couple months through yeah. the open. All right. Thanks, boys. See ya.